Hi everyone, welcome to our fifth anniversary stream. Today my guest will be Miles Tost, our senior, senior level designer. That's hard to say, <laughs> yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, that was hard. <laughs> it's a long title. Yes, hello, hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, we will be playing Blood and Wine today. Uh, we have Sebastian off screen uh, playing the game for us. And the quest that we are doing today is the quest that which is n name is in French, I think. So I'm sorry if I mess it up. <laughs> the one thing harder to say than my title. <laughs> La cache au fou. <laughs> I hope I hope it wasn't too bad. Uh, but basically, this is uh, this is with uh, this is the quest with the spoons. So so we'll see we'll see where where it takes us. Uh, you were the one to, to choose this quest. So maybe you can tell us why did you choose this one specifically? Yes, it's a it's a very narcissistic reason. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a quest I got to work on, together with the uh, fantastic Pavel Sasko. Some of him, uh, some of you may know him, uh, and I think an environment artist for us was um, a guy called uh, Marcin Michalski, who unfortunately doesn't work for us anymore. Yeah. Uh, he went making indie games, I think. Um, but yeah, he got to work with us on this awesome, awesome location, make the Trastamara Mansion, all that, and uh, I think it is a quite the fine quest, if I may say so myself. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course, that's completely fine. Okay, so uh, before we get to those beautiful locations, we have to go meet Re Regis. Uh, so before, let's talk, how long have you been here in CDPR? That's quite, quite a while, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been, I think, I think in January it will be 10 years. Wow. Which is a bit, a bit of a problem for me because we do this awesome like, you know, oh, 10 years, you know, here you get a little present, you get a little showing, all that. And that's <laughs> also cool. But for me, technically, if it's in January, it means I have to have like another oh, whole year yeah, yeah. to a Christmas party. <laughs> we'll have to do. But yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> wow. So how was it before? Because you joined for, was it The Witcher 2 or was it The Witcher 3 already? Witcher 3. I basically um, joined the team right as we hit production, mm -hmm. if I believe correctly. So um, I remember the day I joined where basically um, everyone was pretty much on edge in the studio. Not because of my arrival, um, <laughs> oh, I'd like to I think. don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but there were two things going on. Like the, the day after, I think, we launched the um, Cyberpunk. Reveal cinematic, oh, so that okay. was exciting. But it was also, I think, internally we were first showing the game to journalists, mm -hmm. like the very, very first sort of vertical slice of uh, Witcher Three. Um, so a lot of that was going on, and I remember a lot of that was still built like on on Witcher Two assets. You know, some of the models co imported over, and <laughs> it looked much more like Witcher Two than it, of course, in the final product ended up mm -hmm. looking like. Okay, so I think that was a busy, busy time to join the company. <laughs> yes, it was pretty great though, because I was one of the first level designers. And so the studio also didn't really have like a grasp of level designers, what do we even do with these, right? <laughs> and uh, like there was one other guy who was a level designer when I joined. And uh, he later went on to uh, become our master of destruction and uh, tech artist team. So he basically handles all the, you know, um, destruction work. Uh, and. Uh, so I remember the first few days, it was more like, uh, yeah, they set me in there and they're like, oh, here's our game world, please plan it. <laughs> <laughs> so they were like, uh, so what do the le level designers do? What do we need them for? <laughs> exactly, it was like, uh, okay, I guess Skellige, forest here, mountain there, and then there will be a ruin there. And I basically just spent like the first few days just literally mapping out the entirety of Skellige, which was pretty crazy considering that I started out as an intern and I was like <laughs> right in the middle of it. <laughs> wow, okay. So what do, what do level designers do? Uh, we create chaos for other teams. <laughs> 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 but um, a person much, much more intelligent and wiser than myself um, uh, once taught me this sort of definition, which I think is really, okay. really close to my heart. Um, the idea being that level designers create playgrounds that allow players to express themselves using the systems of a game. Oh. And I think it's quite nice because oftentimes when people think about level design, they think about good looking locations, mm -hmm. right? And just making the stage of the, the screenplay essentially for, you know, that, that you get to uh, play around in. But I think level design is much more than that. It's um, taking into account the game systems, mm -hmm. all the gameplay stuff, right? The combat, the way you move, does it have stealth, you know, the, the, the quest sequences and, and dialogues and all that. And it's trying to create locations that 
cater to this and support these systems, right, to make them stand out and sing better. Oh, oh, I see we have uh, Pavel Sasko gra <laughs> grave here. Speaking of, that's where he is. I've been wondering where he was well around all is day. Is he in the chat or...? The <laughs> yeah, people just told me he was in home office, but... <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> yeah. But he's not the only one, right? No, we no. have more people here. It's actually um, one thing... <laughs> oh, Marcin Shubuovic. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is probably how we pronounce the name. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's like a macabre joke we have is that all of the graves in Blood and Wine reference developers who worked on the game. And uh, this is not just on this graveyard, but it's also on the run um, immediately outside mm -hmm. of Beauclair, where I think I myself may be lying around <laughs> as well. I'm not sure. <laughs> so yeah, you can try to... Um, go through all of these uh, and try to match them and send us all the screenshots of oh, where we lie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, try to find as many people as possible. I also know uh, Amelia for sure is, is there. You know her uh, as a community manager here. So, so we will definitely be able to find her and a lot of other people. So, so we'll see about that. Okay, but when we have like this kind of graveyard, did you have uh, your hand in doing some anything about it, like creating it? Um, I'm actually don't quite remember. I think there was some tweaking and some some designing I was doing here, but I think the bulk work of the location here may have been done, and I might be wrong with that. By fantastically talented um, uh, environment artists these days, mm -hmm. it used to be a QA, um, which is I think this was Kuba Wojnowski. I'm not entirely sure. Um, might be wrong once again, but uh, we have a team of many, many very, very talented. Um, uh, you know, designers, but also artists, uh, quite a few of whom also sort of are QA, who sort of graduated mm -hmm. and became developers, uh, um, you know, as, as the projects went on. And an expansion like this is a fantastic sort of opportunity to give, you know, um, people from inside the studio mm -hmm. who want to give it, to basically take a shot at development, um, a stage and an opportunity to actually make content there. So actually, if I remember correctly, there were quite a few people who, um, uh, you know, we hired and who were new or were trying switching jobs internally, um, having their hand in this expansion. And uh, I think it's, 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 that, that's just such a cool thing of, of expansions. Yeah, but I think I think it's just basically on projects. Some people, you know, start as a QA. Like a lot of people call it like uh, the stepping stone to game dev. So we are entry entry level job, and then and then they they decide on what what path they want to follow. Yeah, um, it happens often, and I'm I'm quite proud to say that I think at CD Project right, we seem to be like really really strong with that. We have a really strong internal QA mm -hmm. team, which is not. Um, Common, I guess, in the industry to have such an like a like a force of uh, embedded uh, quality analysts and assurance uh, testers. Um, but the other thing also is uh, that um, shouldn't be forgotten is, of course, that it's really really difficult to get great QA, right? And it's not it's, it is a stepping stone. And I myself, you know, started out in QA you know, during my studies. Yeah, I was doing like a side gig of. Um, of, te of a tester at a third-party testing uh, company. Um, and, and for many, you know, it, it is like a cool way to get into the job because usually when QA is embedded within another team, mm -hmm. so you have like a gameplay QA guy, you have a narrative QA who works with these respective teams, they get to pick up a lot of the yeah, yeah. Um, knowledge from the respective departments they are set in, allowing them to make that jump eventually, right? But um, it's, it's not to be underestimated how valuable and incredible it is to have really, really good uh, uh, testers and also analysts, which is sort of slightly different, because the way these guys play games is, is, is remarkable. It's really, really important for us to have this, you know, bouncing back, seeing the big picture, mm -hmm, right? Because course. I, as a developer, might be looking at my slice of the game that I create, and these guys, they play it all, right? So they can tell me, you know, the idea that works well in this scenario is cool for that, but in the grand scheme of the game, it doesn't make sense, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, you need to do this with the door and open it in that specific way, but you never do it anywhere else in the game, so how am I supposed to understand it as a player, right? Like, if that is, and it's a, that, that, that is an immense value, right? Mm -hmm. of, co of course, like, good QA is, is very valuable for the company. Uh, so you started as a QA, but in CDPR, your first job was junior uh, intern level designer, yeah. right? 
uh, did, do, you, do you need some specific education, some specific skills to become a level designer? What do you need to learn to, <laughs> to <Yeah>. start? <laughs> a, a part of me would like to say like, yes, it's of course, like super complicated. <laughs> you need like a Harvard degree in level design making. Uh, to, but the reality is, I think, and this goes for most jobs in the industry, mm -hmm. um, that it's quite accessible in the sense that it does not require a special education. Mm -hmm. Um, because in by itself, the industry is still relatively young, right? Yeah, so we yeah, can, definitely. you know, like these things like game universities is only just kind of happening nowadays. And it's getting more and more popular. But um, even in our company, we have lots of people, um, even in the level design team, so it's everywhere essentially, um, that sort of came from entirely different industries mm -hmm. as a background, right? And made their jump into the game industry through a variety of different ways. And, you know, each one of these has like a super fascinating story um, that, you know, like, so I know one of uh, my colleagues, he used to be, for example, a plumber before, you know, he started working as a level designer. And now uh, another person who was a butcher, then we've, we used to have someone who was a lawyer. Um, other developers I know, and especially for level designs, it's kind of cool. We have, I think, two people with an architectural background who used to be architects. Oh, and that okay. for so level design useful. is really, really useful. Yeah, yeah. And also like a constant source of knowledge for the rest of the team, right? Because we can sort of draw on their experiences mm -hmm. as architects to make our level block outs um, better. So the one thing I always kind of tell people then when they try to, to break in the industry yeah, yeah. is mostly that it's not so much about where you come from, but like what you do to get into the industry. And uh, mostly that is in the case of level designs, right? There's so many opportunities and chances these days to start making something on your own. Mm -hmm. You can pick any of the various mod kits for, for games or level builders, right? That, um, you know, allow you to build stuff. Skyrim's creation engine comes to mind, for example, right? Or you can take any of the engines that are out there, Unreal, for example, um, and uh, start building a level there. There are so many resources out on, mm -hmm. on the internet that can get you started. Um, varying degrees of quality, I, there is some sifting that you need to do, but you know, like you can, it was never easier to get into contact with other developers, right? So, so I try to maintain a relatively open channel um, to, <laughs> to, you know, like to new talent, trying to help them out. And uh, uh, as such, uh, equipped with all of these possibilities, it's entirely possible for someone to start building their levels, right? Start mm -hmm. making yeah, stuff, building a portfolio, getting feedback from other, you know, beginners and also even devs. And uh, that way, slowly break their way into the industry. Hmm, yeah, I think uh, that happens pretty often. We have some modders on our team, people who are starting us uh, modding the game, The Witcher 2 or The Witcher 3. And then we saw it and I'm like, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I think last week, Philip was. Was, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 right? no, or the week two, before, two weeks yeah. ago, and uh, uh, he used to start modding for yeah. Witcher Two, right? And that granted him not only the job but also a sword, if I remember correctly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. Okay, so uh, basically, we have some uh, already some questions from the chat. But guys, guys, if if you want to ask some uh, something, feel free to write the question in the chat, and we might answer that. But before we go for the questions, we have uh, we have a joke. What? <laughs> We have a joke from no, 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 Long no. Time I'm from 14. Germany. We don't do jokes. No, no, no. no, no. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, a friend of mine got kidnapped by a group of mimes. They did unspeakable things to him. <laughs> I get it because mimes they don't, don't speak, speak yeah. right? And so when you say unspeakable, you refer. Okay, good. Yeah, I mean, if you have to explain it like that, it doesn't really work. But thank I you for that. I think it works that. even better. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, that, that was that was the first question. A very very important thing that we had to talk about. Uh, but also a small reminder that we are not announcing anything on this stream. We're just talking about uh, game dev stuff, about about the uh, the game itself, about how it is to work here. So please don't expect any announcements or reveals here. But ba back to that. <laughs> just wanted to lay it out there because Manage you know the, expectations. I, the questions are already in the chat. I know it. Uh, but yeah, let's let's see. Uh, do you see a difference between designing a level and designing a whole open world? Yes, <laughs> one is bigger, um, but not as not necessarily more complicated, right? Um, I think people often mistake that uh, 
you know, the scale of the level necessarily correlates to how difficult it is to make it. And while to a degree that is true, um, things become really strange if you follow mm -hmm. that definition and thought of Naughty Dog's games versus, you know, like the big other mm -hmm. open world games that sort of exist, right? Both of them are really hard to make just for very different reasons. And so when talking about our games, um, I'd like to generally differentiate between two kinds of level design. Um, one is, you know, much more micro in the sense that it works on the specific locations for the quests. For example, here when we look at the screen, we have this, you know, uh, this, this grave site. Um, and so on the microscope level, there's like someone who needs to design the location according to the requirements for mm -hmm. the quest, the gameplay and all that stuff, right? And it's this specific instance of the game, this graveyard, the mansion that we'll get to later. These um, follow their own kind of rules. And then there's the other kind, which is a bit more high level mm -hmm. uh, uh, design work where you basically plan the world, right? You figure out how do, how does the player move from one location to the other? How do they stumble upon these locations? How are these locations placed in relation to each other? What is the density of this? You answer all of these kind of questions to make sure that the um, experience that the player has in the mm -hmm. open world is as smooth as possible. And this actually is something that we um, improved in, in Blood and Wine over the base game quite drastically, is the way how these locations chain together, right? So oftentimes in a, in a cave, for example, in Blood and Wine, you'll have a situation where they will have like one entrance and one exit. Mm -hmm. um, and this results in, in the, the reason we did this is, of course, to minimize backtracking. Mm -hmm. But also what usually happens is once you exit the cave from the other side, you'll get the next potential target visible okay, on the horizon yeah. already, right? So you leave the cave, you see that castle on a hill in the distance, uh, you know, tempting you to come <laughs> explore it. And um, doing it is like a way of allowing the player to constantly have this call of adventure, mm, right? This and is uh, cool. uh, yeah. I mean, speaking of level design, I know that often when I play the games, I see like clearly, okay, I know that they want me to go this way. So do we use this kind of tricks in, in our games or how, how do they look like? Sometimes it's very like clear, you basically have a, an arrow pointing you somewhere or like a specific color telling you, okay, this is where you're supposed to go. What do we use? <laughs> do we use something? Yeah, I mean, we have various methods there and it really kind of depends on the vision of game that you're trying to build, mm -hmm. right? Because a lot of people give games flag who are too obvious mm -hmm, yeah i think it's a context thing right sometimes you play a game where it's not so much about the difficulty of puzzles and all that stuff and more about the ride and just the experience and the you know just being immersed in it then it's cool to provide a lot of outs for the player and hints and all that that tell them where to mm -hmm. go in in more or less subtle ways um and we, we utilize these, these, you know, level design techniques as well, right? For that, we have methods like using the lighting to, mm -hmm. to make certain areas of a level stand out more than others to guide the player's attention and eye to yeah. where they need to be, right? Because we want to convey specific information, right? We want to tell the player where they should go, what they should do and all of these things, right? So they know whether they go and do it is their choice. But it's really a matter of planting the thought, you know, mm -hmm. that uh, when, when you see the exit, it's fine, you can go roam around and loot it. But the reality is that even in these scenarios, that is already a success, right? Even if the player doesn't commit to it, because it allows, gives the player the information, okay, this is where the quest continues, yeah. this is where it can continue. So you feel more comfortable actually taking the mm -hmm. time to explore whatever other so area. So you already you know where to go to, to like finish the quest and you can... Yeah, exactly. And mm -hmm. I think there's almost nothing worse for me in, in, in when I play a game uh, and, you know, I think that I have a grasp of where it continues and when it continues and I want to go and explore and then I go and it triggers a cutscene and then actually it continues and I'm like, wait, but I thought... Yeah, you know. yeah, I know, the same. I, I know, when you don't know which, which way is the main story but you still want to roam around and you you go the wrong way, the main story way, and you cannot go back. That's, yes, that sucks. Yes. And uh, that's, you know, something where if it happens, you can probably blame the level designer for <laughs> okay. it uh, And it, It's not good, uh, but it happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so when you play a game, uh, obviously we know you, you stream and you, you also talk about level design a lot on your streams. 
so what's your like type of playing do you do you just go main story or do you focus on like I, what i call it licking the walls so basically <laughs> <laughs> basically going into every corner checking stuff out that's such a great way of <laughs> wow you don't want to do that in cyberpunk though like the walls are very dirty oh yeah uh, <laughs> we sure do. there can be some weird stuff too. Um, <laughs> it's probably more so the latter I think when I'm in my streams, it's a bit difficult because the focus is on sort of exposing how difficult but also awesome the work mm -hmm. of developers yeah. is on the game. So it tends to be that even in games where I think they're relatively short and I go like, yeah, we can totally crush them in like two or three streams. We never finish them because <laughs> usually we spend like an hour just in the first 10 minutes looking, you know, at uh, certain aspects and it's... Um, really, really cool to see in different games how developers tackle essentially the same problems that yeah. you know all kind of developers have, but they all find different methods and cool ways of doing it, sometimes similar ways, right? And it's really, really interesting for me also to see that what works in one game doesn't necessarily work in another yeah. game, right? And uh, my goal with that is a bit to... Cause it's very easy for developers to get flack from from um, yeah, well people in the community like for why can't you just make it like this and all of that stuff right and um, that's easy for one part of the community to say that but it's also easy for the developer then to turn around and go you idiots why don't you know this right you know my job is hard and all that stuff and the reality is frankly that um, how can the people from the community really know this when developers do like a really bad job actually at being transparent mm -hmm. about how the magic works, right? And just never unlifting the veil. And part of why I think, for example, what Pavel does is really, really awesome, right? Because it is exactly shining the spotlight on the difficulty of this and how each and every decision we make as developers usually has like this huge trail of conversations mm -hmm. leading up to it, right? And nothing ever almost happens by accident in video game of development. Course. Everything is thought to through like 20 times over and you can't do this because this would happen otherwise and this would happen otherwise. So you choose the lesser evil, you know, to kind of... <laughs> oh, just like girls. <laughs> yes, uh, that's, that's the life of a developer. <laughs> it's difficult. Uh, and... Yeah, so um, I think it's important for developers to shine a light on that and kind yeah, of show yeah, everyone, hey, you know, this is this is complicated, but it's great and awesome process, and uh, you know, get everyone on board and share mm -hmm. that passion. Uh, so from what you are talking about, it seems like uh, there is, a, I mean, it, it doesn't seem it is like that. There is a lot of cooperation in between teams. So which teams do you cooperate with the most and well, what the, the, the process? Basically, what's first? Like, do you first get a quest script uh, and, or the environment or the level or <laughs> <laughs> where, um, where does uh, it start? <laughs> yeah, um, I mostly drink coffee and troll people on Twitter and then tell people, I try to push people to get to do awesome shit. And, uh, uh, and complain about things. That's sort of okay, how my... Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's very Polish. You're, you're accommodating to our country. <laughs> <laughs> very much, very much. It speaks to me on a different <laughs> level. Um, <laughs> but no. Um, usually, uh, this has kind of changed over the course of the years that I've mm -hmm. been here. Um, how it used to be much more is that um, at the very beginning, and in that way, it's kind of cool that, you know, having been here for as long as I have, it's kind of like watching this crazy coming of mm -hmm. age story with the studio. Um, at the beginning, our process was relatively rowdy, you know, it was pretty wild, pretty chaotic, pretty free form, but um, it resulted in lots of people sort of being able to um, add their ideas, mm -hmm. test things out, right? And yeah, we had a bit of a problem with feature creep and during Witcher 3's development, right? Because everyone was kind of trying to sneak in some cool things, but it is part of the reason why you find all of these little cool details uh, scattered across the world, right? Because it's usually come from a place of not trying to sabotage our project, but usually wanting to make things really cool yeah. and better than good, right? And um, so we would do this cooperation in level design, for example, where either the quest, uh, we'd have both scenarios, really, where the quest designers would come over and go like, hey, I have my quest here, we need these kind of locations, what can you give us? And we'd be like, oh, this part of the quest sounds like it could be in a cave. I have just the right cave lying around here. Uh, and uh, we'd pick it and adapt it to what was going on, okay. right? Um, but we also have the other uh, scenario, which nowadays is a bit 
less likely to happen, where level designers or location artists would have created some stuff, you know, as planning the world mm -hmm. because it's something we do, you know, like hey, you know, th there's there's so many bricks in this world. Somewhere these bricks should come from. So let's make a brick makers village somewhere, right? And uh, uh, these things would start existing, and then we pitch these to the uh, quest designers, mm -hmm. you know, to, to help us add content for these. And, uh, you know, I think over the years, our process has developed quite a bit. As the company grew, we cleaned up our process a bit more, right? And um, um, and these, these, these processes kept changing. But I think uh, at, at some point, we may have gone even a little bit overboard with like cleaning that up, so like the the individuals might have not been able to to contribute as much as mm -hmm, um, they used to. And uh, you know, for a short, brief moment, uh, we may have lost like I guess a bit of a sense of what made us so successful to begin with, mm -hmm. which is sort of like our our you know insane, insane focus on delivering super high quality stuff, right? And the cool thing is for me that, and I think this is something that uh, might not be obvious to many of our fans out there these days, but when we create new content, we have pretty much, you know, changed our style of development into a way that's quite a bit more efficient, I must say, but also um, um, lets people, again, contribute on a, on a, you know, from all kinds of angles. That's and awesome. uh, this brings me back to the beginning of the question, <laughs> can do this loop. Where, you know, speaking of the departments, I don't think I've ever worked closer with um, our sound designers, our cinematic mm -hmm. designers, um, quest designers, environment artists, gameplay designers, and even QA, you know, like to make the stuff that we're making as good as it can be. And um, I'm really, really quite happy that the, the way we've sort of shifted our development yeah. style in recent times has resulted in like a much more... Um, efficient, collaborative, creative, and most importantly to me, because of that, fun way of, of developing. That's yeah. the most important part of the Isn't job, I just, guess. Right? <laughs> awesome. So uh, maybe maybe it's time for a few questions from the chat, because I see we're getting some. Um, the question from Kinley is, Miles, what is your favorite piece of environmental storytelling in The Witcher 3? And why is it the two towers in Tatskelige Valley? <laughs> <laughs> First off, Hey, Kinley. <laughs> nice to see you around. Um, secondly, uh, favorite piece of environmental storytelling. I think, I'm not sure if it is my favorite, but one that comes to my mind is that we had, um, at some point, when you're trying to save Dandelion, mm -hmm. as always, um, <laughs> he gets in there's trouble. this moment where you break into, uh, is it? gnomes or dwarves who have this counterfeit um, painting workshop uh, in a basement yeah, yeah. and uh, we had a lot of fun you know sort of coming up with ways to make like okay these gnomes they're not very tall but like they're trying to use the height of the entire sort of basement for them so they came up with all kinds of contraptions and sort of little scaffolding that oh, allows them cool. to create these gigantic paintings <laughs> and uh, basically counterfeits of existing mm -hmm. paintings in in the world and uh, I, I know that was like a lot of fun to just kind of make also like you know taking the paint buckets that we have just kind of <laughs> spewing them everywhere Generally speaking, that is sort of on, on the small scale, but what I am, I think, particularly proud of when it comes to Witcher 3's visual storytelling is not so much what happens just on the smallest level of detail, but rather how the world itself has been constructed in a way that it in by itself makes sense, right? You could take Geralt uh, out of the equation, and it, I think you could still have the sense that the world would exist and work in its way, right? So. While it is not up to the scale that it might need to be, if you look at the city of Novigrad, you have the infrastructure needed to believably and plausibly keep this place running, right? This is a real of, city. Yeah, we there's can lots feel of it. agriculture mm -hmm. around it to feed the people in the yeah. city, right? The, the way the city is laid out makes sense for it, right? Mm -hmm. You have the areas where they do the tanning, the leather works and all that outside of the walls because that would smell bad usually, mm -hmm. right? Again, as I said, the 
Brickmakers are one of my favorite examples because they are not only a little homage to Witcher 1 uh, south in the swamps, but if you look at that location in particular, you see not only that, yeah, somewhere the bricks that Novigrad is built with, they, it comes from somewhere, but um, you have the process of it being made, then you have a big main road connected to the, the shoreline there mm -hmm. where there's like a little ferry space that in this ferry space um, or ferry harbor that's where they load the bricks up and transport mm -hmm. them to the north right to Novigrad but also there's a main road connected all the way from this uh, from this brickmakers village in the far south of the world all the way to the north so you can have like this if you really want to look for it sense of there being a believable mm -hmm. infrastructure yeah, at some sense. point before the war broke out in this session, <laughs> right wow that, that's a really cool example yeah and no. I, I think that's something we, we took a lot of care of, right? Like whenever we would build something, we'd always ask the question first, why would it be here? Um, you know, usually um, the way people build villages is they don't, don't just randomly place mm -hmm. it in, like, in real life, right? They don't just randomly found a village at any random spot, but there's usually something that warrants that village being where it is. Yeah. And, uh, However, on the other side, when you make games, sometimes you have to force that and go, okay, but we need this village to be exactly here because of the main quest story and blah, blah, blah. You know, we need it to be in the mountain because of this. And then you have to think, okay, these guys live in a mountain, which is really a shitty place for people to build a village. Yeah. That's really harsh, right? Um, so why would they do this? And we usually try to give them a really good reason. Mm -hmm. Like maybe they're miners and they, they mine for gold here. And the, this, this important resource has resulted in them facing the harsh conditions of this area and kind of building their... Yeah, it their, has to be believable for yeah. them to be in such a place. And that's something that we always try to kind of consider with our stuff. And I think that's, that's the visual storytelling that <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm really proud of. Okay, um, so let me ask you about another thing. Uh, there are a lot of differences between Blood and Wine and the base Witcher game, uh, including level design. So could you like talk about it? Was it challenging to work on it? What, what did you like more, The Witcher 3 or Blood and Wine? Yes, uh, ooh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, of course, of course, it was very challenging. All of game dev is, is, is really complicated. And, uh, um, but in another way, it's, it's, it's like a very different thing to make an expansion versus the base game, mm -hmm. right? Because if you start making the base game, it's kind of like opening Witcher 3's map for the first time, right? You have so many question marks. Uh, and you know, you just look and go like, oh my god, what is, where do I even start, <laughs> yeah. right? And um, then you kind of, you know, like at, at the end of the development of like a base game, you have explored most of these question marks. You know the answers, you know what's behind them, right? Like all the, the development questions, like how does the game work? What can the player do? All of that. Yeah. You have answered this. You, the game has launched usually, right? <laughs> People have played it. You get feedback what worked, what doesn't, you know? And you can take all of that knowledge and move it into the creation of the expansion. Mm. And that makes expansions for me particularly fun to make because no longer are you, you know, trying to answer the, the big sort of uh, question as to how the game has to be made. Um, no longer do the tools that we have need to be developed to, in order to make the game, yeah. but you have all that in place and it's pure creative, you know, creation process. You can get crazy. Exactly. And that's usually why uh, expansions, not just for us, tend to have the more mm -hmm. sort of like crazy ideas and all that because, you know, like you, you free yourself from a lot of sort of baggage mm -hmm. that, that uh, you need to answer in, in a base game. and so. That makes development uh, between these two very, very different, right? And also, for me personally, a lot more fun uh, because it allows people to really just focus on mm -hmm. making cool stuff, trying to uh, use what they learned, you know, and to make better scenarios, improve and iterate on existing ideas and all that. And uh, I think Blood and Wine is a great example of this where, you know, and this is sort of why this question, which one do you like better, is, is very <laughs> difficult because... Um, I think the, the open world of Blood and Wine, generally speaking, is sort of the pinnacle of the Witcher 3 sort mm -hmm. of, you know, like universe open world creation and is in many ways improved over the base game's open world experience. Yeah. Um, and same goes for, you know, the way we do cinematics, cutscenes and all of that stuff. All of that is, 
you know, much cooler uh, in in Blood and Wine because you know we sort of improved our skills and used our experience to improve that. From a level design perspective, a couple of things that we tried to bring in um, as we were creating new locations there was, for example, the rule of having multiple exits for locations or more smartly looping our locations back to the main entrance, right? Yeah, okay, so that yeah. you wouldn't have this backtracking experience. Trustamara Mansion is a great example of this because um, it also has a second exit, you know, at the very end when you defeat or battle the Spoon White. Um, Spoiler spoilers. <laughs> um, um, it's and seven years after release. <laughs> yeah, and, and you see like the, the way that we then chain these uh, yeah. um, points of interest together and all that. That's th something that's improved. Um, the general navigation we try to improve in, in Blood and Wine when it comes to sort of how intuitive it is to, to move through the world. So Beauclair has exits in many, many directions of this city to allow the player to, you know, like not have this scenario where, okay, you want to go right to the to the to the east but the way you would do that is by going all the way to the west and yeah, then around that, that right sense. and we eliminated a lot of that mm -hmm. to make the experience in by itself much much smoother yeah. um and then there's like tiny tiny small tweaks that i'm not sure people really noticed but they are important to us mm -hmm. right um for example i remember going through the fast travel points and setting up that first shot that when you spawn in and you would not move the camera at all that first opening shot usually is much more picturesque uh, and because it's more deliberately chosen than the ones in the rest of the game. So in the rest of the game, you kind of look at, you know, like the, at a tree right in front of you <laughs> as the fast roll pot. Here in, in Blood and Wine, it most often is that you're greeted with this amazing vista, right? So because the fast roll point was rotated yeah, in just yeah. the way that when the <laughs> player spawns, you know, it gets so this So that's a very small detail, but I think <laughs> I think it gives something special to the game. Yeah, I think, you know, like, <laughs> hey, you get the picture, uh, postcard picture moment all the time. Okay, so this is the mansion that you designed. Uh, can you tell us uh, something spicy, maybe some secrets <laughs> that it holds? Yeah, I remember when I was pitched this idea, the idea of a spoon white was really odd to me. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, Miles, this is okay. It's spoons. It's spoons everywhere. <laughs> like, oh, okay. And it really took me a while of getting this explanation of how the spoons, spoons fit in. <laughs> yeah, right, it's spoons. And you know, the gen the stroke of genius really is to tie this whole thing to the you know the the Gaunter or Dim sort of thought mm. line. Uh, yeah, know, like, yeah, it's like, yeah. And he, he <coughs> with the spoon. Yeah, and mm. I think this really tells us like is 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 how we do our weaving and storytelling, mm -hmm. right? It's like we come up with crazy ideas, but all of these need to be grounded and believable yeah. within the context of the world. And suddenly a crazy idea like, yeah, it's a monster who collects spoons, <laughs> you know? Um, which may be from mythology. I'm not entirely sure. Um, some of the stuff we do is, some of the stuff is sort of like uh, more original. Um, but sort of um, tying that into like our existing sort of narrative and universe makes all of it better, right? It doesn't just make the quest better, but it makes the other part of the, you know, like the Hearts of Stone stuff essentially better. And it's really, really nice. <clears throat> and yeah, I remember basically working on this and I think we, the when we already started working on this, we were kind of sure that this should be like a horror-esque kind of experience, mm -hmm. right? We don't go like, you know, fucking amnesia levels of, you know, like like horror with our quest, but we make spooky stuff, mm -hmm. I suppose. And uh, uh, that was kind of something we knew before. So we that's why we have lots of these longer corridors in there, right? Where it's a bit more claustrophobic and you can't see too far and around the corner. Lots of places where it feels like you could be ambushed, little nooks and crannies, right? Uh, and of course, this this freaky moment where you um, sit at the uh, table with the, the spoon white uh, oh, itself, yeah. right? And I think this is one of the really cool things about being Geralt as a monster hunter is that you don't just, you know, plan to execute the monster to begin with but sometimes you have these scenarios where you get really uncomfortably close to them right and instead of fighting them outright you're forced to well have a dinner with the monster right that's and it's weird. like uh, <laughs> it is it's pretty strange <laughs> but it's I, I i think that's sort of what makes you know the monster hunting experience when Geralt does it really really unique and mm -hmm. really really uh, fascinating from a player's perspective also so you just put spoons everywhere in this location. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. It's uh, it's spoons everywhere. <laughs> and like I remember um, 
one of the cool I'm not sure if that was planned from the very beginning because it's been a while since then, right? We've, uh, we were making this in 2015. Yeah. Right? Um, so I'm not sure. I, I just rem have this, this moment in my head that I remember it was really, really cool when I first heard the wind chime sounds from the spoon. So they, you know, it's again, it's not just spoons, right? And just <laughs> random spoons lying around. But this guy, this, this monster does something with yeah. it and it becomes decoration, something else. And the, the wind chimes add to the spooky atmosphere and all that, right? And uh, coming up with all of these ideas is, is a very fun creative process, <laughs> yeah. right? And, uh, you know, like these kind of moments that we have here, are uh, even in, in the Witcher game, um, relatively rare, right? Because Either you arrive usually a bit too late, the monster has already killed everything, right? Or you, you kind of, it's outright, it's the griffin. You need to go kill the griffin, yeah. right? Or whatever. And here, you know, you don't really have even like this human interaction with a monster because it's still like this monster, but it's, it's this really bizarre in-between space. And I think, uh, yeah, you even get to make the choice there. <laughs> <laughs> Oof, we picked the right one. <laughs> I mean, the good one, I guess. Also intriguing, like, I think this is this got to be the only instance where, um, as a player, we actually have to hide somewhere dedicated or like one of the ah, few moments. Yeah. And um, one, one thing that for me always is, is interesting that, and that's something we'll be talking about with the QA stuff, right? Uh, unique instances like these can be really treacherous because they're cool as place when they when they are created you know for the quest itself and you know you only play the quest and it makes like sense like as a standalone yeah but if the player has never learned that hiding in a closet right is <laughs> ever a thing in any part of the the game then it's kind of difficult to get the player to do that right um, you probably have a need to have like a very clear prompt to tell you that no hide. Yeah, and that's sort of what we need to, like in our situation, then we need to be a bit more on the nose with these kind of situations, right? Whereas, for example, think about the, uh, am yeah, think about Amnesia or the Alien games, right? You see a closet, you instantly know, okay, I can hide in there. And mm -hmm, that's something yeah. that you do. The game doesn't need to prompt or to explain that to you uh, in the later stage at all. But we need to work on this much, much stronger, right? So you can, you know, use your witcher senses to see the, the closet. It's highlighted, right? You go close to it. It has a prompt on it that says hide and all that. It's very, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. very in the note. Geralt says, mm, I guess I need to hide in, there, <laughs> in, the, in the closet, right? And it's like, there's a lot of help that you get to do this. Um, but, uh, and, and, you know, if on one end you can say, yeah, I mean, this is a bit obvious, right? But on the other end, it's needed because yeah, of yeah, the context yeah, of, uh, that you, you work with. <laughs> and it's always something that as developers, you need to kind of um, acknowledge and also uh, uh, be conscious of. So this is like the only time in the game where you actually need to hide? That you remember of? I think the <laughs> one that I remember, there might be another instance or so, but like mm -hmm. I, I'm sure that some of this happens in like, uh, for example, um, when you meet the ice giant for the first mm -hmm. time, uh, you don't actually, like Geralt hides on cutscene, right? Like he yeah, kind of hides yeah. away. It's not you actually hiding. Um, because it's not really a mechanic that we have in, in our game, right? Uh, uh, and Stealthy Witcher. St <laughs> Stealthy Witcher, right? But That's not yeah, very often <laughs> but, but sometimes, you know, for these narrative experiences, it's cool to kind of create these yeah, scenarios, yeah. right? So um, it's always so, sort of finding the balance of creating the new and the unexpected and trying to mm -hmm. create the variety, variety while at the same time keeping in mind how the player might react to it. Mm -hmm. So you said that you wanted to have like a horror uh, theme in this, uh, in this location. And this is actually a question from Quelv. Uh, were you ever at this point where you looked at it and like, oh no, it's too scary, we have to dial down? Or maybe, oh no, it's, it's too, too normal, let's dial up. Uh, hmm. I think it's rather the opposite side, like because we're not, you know, we're not in the business of making horror yeah, yeah, to begin course. with. I think um, for us, the bigger problem is kind of to make sure that it's still spooky enough, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I would almost wager that it is probably harder to make something too creepy than, you know, not creepy enough when you want yeah, it to for... be creepy. Um, and it's the same thing when it comes to generally like designing a quest or a location on gameplay. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> puzzle mechanics are, are a great example of this because developers tend to overestimate um, how 
good players are or how, how maybe that's the wrong way of wording it but rather how obvious things are by us right mm -hmm. or from us so and I myself have found myself in this situation very often I know lots of you know designers that constantly fall into this trap where you think okay I've made everything in this puzzle so super obvious and it's so easy to solve now and then you give it to the first player to test it and they're like I don't get it <laughs> <laughs> right, and uh, it's very easy for a developer to then go and develop this fa false sense of pride, and like, oh, you're an idiot, you know, like, oh, I don't want to, um, and, yeah. it, and and here it's really a case of when you create puzzles, it's really hard to make something too easy, um, which is not intuitive, right? It's a, you, you think it's it's more easy to you know accidentally result in a puzzle that's way too easy to solve right okay, but yeah. the, the the practical reality is that that's much more rarely the case and i don't think i've ever experienced a situation where a developer has accidentally made something too easy but i've ma experienced a thousand cases where a developer has accidentally made things too hard right and uh, that usually is then a problem because um, while challenge is a good thing um, if something is just too hard in a game where you don't want it to be yeah. like this, you know, unless you're like a Souls game player, uh, um, usually that can lead to a lot of frustration, yeah. right? And uh, um, this kind of frustration, the worst case, when it cannot be solved by the player, can result in the player stopping playing. And uh, this is particularly difficult for us mm -hmm. because we tell stories and for us it's really really bad when the player opts out of a story because you know like they can't solve a puzzle it's like uh, so, yeah, it's a catastrophe really right like oh. um, so we'd rather then err on the side of making the puzzle easier yeah. in order to let the story be experienced which is really where our focus is mm -hmm. like where our strong suit is right and then you look at other developers like from software of whom I'm a huge fan and they're focuses on the other side, right? So they rather, um, like there, the, the struggle, the, the frustration that you have also from fighting, it's, it's part of the game. You overcome that and that's when you feel great, right? And it's an awesome experience, um, as tough as it can be. And it just kind of goes to show that in game development in general, um, there's no silver bullet, right? And everything is, uh, like the methods that you apply to the design of your game is highly contextual to what kind of game you're yeah, trying definitely. to make. Um, and which makes game development so incredibly fascinating for me because on my streams I also talk a lot about, you yeah, know, these are things, techniques that designers do and all that. But you can't take these and, and, and apply them to every game and assume that they mm -hmm. just work like that, right? And, uh, you know, in some games, you, you, I was actually talking to this um, with uh, one of our uh, junior level designers just earlier today. Um, uh, actually, I can talk about it. We had like a situation where you need to climb something. Huge spoiler. Um, oh, wow. And, uh, <laughs> and um, uh, there were some shrubs on that thing, right? And uh, I, I told her essentially that, yeah, these shrubs make it so that the player doesn't want to climb there, even though we want the player mm -hmm. to climb there. But in another game, these shrubs would be the place where you'd climb, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Go, I, like, I, I, I just wanted to say that you, you sometimes climb the shrubs on the yeah, where, where you or have something. mechanics, right? Like, so they can be a visual tell mm -hmm. by a level designer to show, ooh, there is some shrubbery, and that's where I need to climb. In other games, it's yeah, that's the place you can't climb, and you need to look for the place without the you know shrubbery to kind of climb there. And it's uh, you know, this this kind of stuff um, is is. It's fun, right? It's, it's really interesting to figure out what is the medicine, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the working design for your game, giving the content that you have, and which is why it's always also difficult to kind of, you know, um, go into the internet and read these silver bullet solutions, you know, <laughs> oh, where yeah, people go like, yeah, it work. works in this I one game. Why don't they just do it in that game, right? And like <laughs> also do it. Uh. Well, okay. Um, so you've been talking about puzzles uh, a little while before. <laughs> uh, any favorite puzzles you created for uh, our games? Maybe The Witcher, maybe Cyberpunk? Yeah, see, that's a bit of a difficult one because we don't really do create a lot of mm -hmm. very, very complicated puzzles, right? I think in Witcher, our puzzles don't really go further than Igni, this weird rock, you <laughs> yeah. know, and then the door <laughs> yeah. opens. It's usually much, much more simple than that. And if we do have it, then it's it's heavily guided, right? Mm -hmm. Through narration, Geralt, you know, looks at, the, like, has the Witcher senses, the clues that guide them to the solution. And again, this is because of, you know, how we focus and prioritize our experience. 
so um, when I say like we made a cool puzzle, I feel it's always like you then get look at you know games that dedicate their time to puzzles, like I don't know the Zelda series, right? Yes. And it's like okay, that's a puzzle, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, uh, I. I once, you know, like actually, I can give a little de development anecdote about this, rather, oh, okay. as opposed Let's to. Go. So sorry, I'm not gonna totally go for for a puzzle here, but um, I was one of the people responsible for sort of creating the locations for the treasure hunts in Witcher Three. Basically, um, the the major uh, locations for this, one of them being the Lynx dungeon, where you get the. It's under Novigrad, mm -hmm. right? This elven ruin where you get the beginning. That's the whole thing with the corrupted Witcher Kieran that, um, you know, and you get the cat armor thing right there and all that. And originally, I wanted this to be um, like a much more complicated mm -hmm. complicated puzzle section, right? Where you'd go in and it'd be almost like a little um, reference to, to um, one of my favorite games of all time, which is uh, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. And um, I wanted to have this segment where some raves would pop up and essentially they'd sort of you know, go to one corridor on the left and one to the right, you know, and the player was meant to kind of follow that and, you know, defeat each wraith, which when they'd come back out of their respective wing would result in like a flame popping up and you hopefully getting the note that, yeah, okay, I killed the wraith, it did a thing, the fire turned on, there's a second fire, probably I kill other wraith, you know, like that was the sort of thing. Reality is when we were playtesting this kind of stuff, people didn't get it. You know, even though it was basically implemented exactly how I kind of kind of described it. I thought it. it was so easy. I thought it was mega easy, right? Nintendo did it. You know, like they, they did it, do stuff for people so that you can <laughs> solve it. Even, you know, you have no tutorial problems. They're masters of this kind yeah. of stuff. And I thought, Haha, if we just do a similar idea, it's got to work. But again, context, you know, like, and we kind of figured, okay, this is not going to work. So what we did, and it broke my heart at the time, but now being a more senior developer, looking back at it, I fully understand it. We replaced it with a golem that's just roaming in the middle, <laughs> right? So you kill the really strong golem and then you can basically uh, pass through. Uh, but it's, it just goes to show um, how, yeah, again, once again, the context of the game really matters when you yeah. kind of, and also, um, you kind of have to ask yourself if when people play a Witcher game, is it really a game where you want to spend a lot of time solving complicated puzzles? Or is it more about like, yeah, I want to see what this story develops into and all that stuff, right? Uh, yeah. But would you uh, ever want, want to create such a puzzle? I mean, I mean, I know some games and uh, sometimes they can be annoying when, uh, when trying to solve those puzzles. But then when you actually solve it, the, uh, you, you, you are so happy that you actually managed to do this. Hell yeah, I love to do this. <laughs> I mean, you know, sometimes we afford ourselves the luxury these days to kind of add these little things in. More so lately, I think, um, to those of you who've been diving into our cyberpunk uh, patches that we've been uh, moving out, the whole Nibbles thing, for example, right? Uh, like these yeah. little things. We've been, we've some been secrets. doing some secrets <laughs> and cryptic stuff there, right? And, uh, you know, on the occasion, um, like in, in cyberpunk, there's, for example, one <laughs> this is a totally blood and wine topic. There's uh, during the parade. There's a little puzzle, um, which again kind of shows how how far we want to take these, or uh, or maybe not brave enough. Maybe we should be more brave. I don't know. You tell us. Um, but like, there's a moment where you can break into like the, there's a little side room where there's uh, some grated door, and behind it there's some treasure, like mm -hmm. a legend, iconic legendary weapon that you can can get. And uh, so. Uh, the idea is there's there's a little puzzle hidden there. It's not telegraphed, right? But it's uh, meant to allow the player to find the code for a terminal that if inserted, the code will open the door mm -hmm. and you can get the loot. Something we do nowhere else in the game and as a result, players don't really look for it, right? Um, however, uh, because of this, what we also decided is to simply put a very difficult skill check on the door to also allow okay, other players to kind of break in, right? Open it. And, and now it's up for debate whether this is the right way of doing it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and as a designer, we have a lot of back and forth discussions about this, whether it's cool to do it, whether it should be more, you know, non-linear in the sense that you take this option out to easily break it open yes. and only keep this. So it's just a reward for those people who look really, really closely, which I personally am a big fan of. Um, but you sort of have these debates, right? And it's not always clear, like the Witcher universe, right? It's always black and white, you know? It's yeah. not black and white, it's shades <laughs> of gray, right? Things are, like with design, there's not often like the clear 
sort mm -hmm. of this is the way to design thing or not and uh, um, even to this day we're sort of still refining our processes we're having these conversations and I guess though with you know how positively I would say these um, little secrets have been uh, <laughs> sort of uh, taken and uh, you know there's still some out there guys uh, it's it's cool to, to get that sort of positive feedback for mm. it, right? For us. <laughs> nice. Okay, so you basically told us to just roam around. So uh, wha why did you do that? What, be, what can you tell us about Toussaint? It could be a trap, though, because like I, as a level designer, you must also understand, <laughs> have the interest of you just roaming around everywhere, right? So maybe there's nothing, but I just want you to take a look at all the awesome stuff we made. Mm. I mean... <laughs> 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 you tell me. <laughs> Are you like, uh, there is a monster hidden somewhere, right? <laughs> <laughs> there, there's, I mean, it's a Witcher world. <laughs> it's <gotta be> <laughs> yeah. That's it, okay, so uh, I, I saw that Sebastian actually took fast travel to get here. Yes. And I've heard you several times, <laughs> like talking about fast travel. Like, if you fast travel, there's a level designer that dies somewhere, uh, somewhere in the world. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have a very strong opinion. <laughs> <laughs> What's the opinion? <laughs> <laughs> I joke around a lot, saying that if you fast travel um, somewhere, some place in the world, a level designer dies. <laughs> so don't fast travel. <laughs> this is, of course, a very biased sort of view on fast travel. However, I um, I do have a bit of a reasoning for it, right? Not only do we level designers and also the environment artists, because it's like two disciplines who are kind of responsible for making the locations in a world, um, spend a lot of time of making all these cool places. And I honestly think there is a lot of, you know, value in just doing what we're seeing on screen, just kind of roaming around, taking in the world and sort of pretending a bit like you're actually Gerald wandering, mm. right? Um, but a Witcher is on the path after all, right? What's the Witcher without the path? Um, <laughs> so, uh, but on the other hand, you know, I um, do think that fast travel, um, as much of a convenience as it is, I think a good amount of players, um, how do I formulate this? Uh, a good amount of players sort of um, use it because it's a bit too convenient, right? Mm -hmm. And they would otherwise um, not use it if the game was designed in a way that would um, encourage them to be in the world more, yeah. right? Uh, and one method how we try to do this in Witcher 3, for example, is have roads be something where Roach has infinite stamina on, right? So it, it encourages movement between yeah. locations in a non-fast travel way. Um, whereas on other games, such as Red Dead Redemption, they do it with a cool cinematic camera and all that stuff, right? To allow you to fast travel in between places. And usually, oftentimes, for players that is well received, right? That isn't to mean that I'm generally an enemy of the fast travel mechanic as a whole. I think, you know, when you when you have very little time to play and you just want to get from place to place, it is um, a cool tool to, to do that. But I think there's, there's probably methods and things we can do, as we've done uh, started mm -hmm. doing in, in, in Witcher 3, where um, you can sort of dis discourage players from doing it, you know, or, or rather, rather different encourage them to rather not do it because of, you know, the world, how awesome it is, how the, the stuff that you can stumble into. And if you think about it, that really is what happens, right? If you fast travel, it is usually with the, the, the intent of cutting out the yeah, fluff yeah, in you're between missing it, on right? Much and stuff you, along the way. Exactly. You miss out on the opportunity of kind of stumbling into yeah. stuff, right? And uh, there's an experience thing here and like a design d um, discussion that can be had for mm -hmm. hours on. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to have it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so when you play a game, do you fast travel? <laughs> <laughs> Only usually, uh, like when I have to show something specific. Okay. Um, like because you know, like uh, I, it depends. If I play for myself, I usually actually do not fast travel mm -hmm. because I'm kind of considered part of the journey usually like the the, the experience and I do like to get lost and sort of sidetrack from mm -hmm. one thing to the other and kind of also um, you know just sort of experience that call of adventure when it when it does call right um, uh, however I have I have fast traveled in the past I will say this so there, there may be a level designer or two potentially more <laughs> That that are on my on my death note essentially. No level no level designers were hurt during this stream. <laughs> Not during this. 
Wait, we did fast travel. <laughs> oh, God. Just once, just once. How shit would it be if I went back to the studio now and one of our juniors kind of just collapsed and I, it'd be your fault. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Okay, uh, so uh, we, we already finished the quest, but I think we can roam around uh, a little bit more because we have, we have a couple more questions. Uh, a very important question is basically, you play the game and obviously it's, it's also kind of like a research for you. You, you look at uh, some, uh, some stuff that other developers did and you probably take some inspirations, but do you have some other sources of inspiration? Than other than games? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, since we work on open world games, um, the cool thing is that... <laughs> I, I doubt that, lady. <laughs> um, the, there's like a, um, a lot of aspects in real life that we can take inspiration mm -hmm. from, right? Be it because of, you know, like the, the roaming experience we have here, but sort of like because the way we do our content, the quests and all that, they're filled with a variety of different, yeah. you know, like stories and uh, that, that draw inspiration from ver various aspects of real life, right? Um, and I know that, you know, film is a big one for us. Uh, and also, on that note, it really also depends on the discipline you talk to, right? Our cinematic designers might draw from film much more strongly, yeah, for example, than um, maybe our quest designers who may be more inspired by, I'm just making this up now, like, for <laughs> books or so, right? So I'm sure a quest designer will immediately correct me, like, no, it's not just books, it's also films and whatever. Okay, right? no, but as a level designer, let's say, real life, is it? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's it's uh, like a lot of the solutions that we apply, you know, when it comes to player guidance, um, uh, is, is also kind of rooted in how things are done in real life. Um, uh, and it's also great because we can kind of come up with super gamey solutions and then we usually have a way of pointing at a real life scenario mm -hmm. and go it's done like this right so heavy signage usage for example where um you know you have like the yellow stripe on the ground leading you to this specific section of the level and you go like oh wow cheap is it they just did like a little line that leads <laughs> me to where it is well there are hospitals in the world that utilize this or airports right that have stuff on the ground yeah. where you just kind of follow that um and so that's cool when it comes to for example what we've done with cyberpunk right um here uh it's always kind of cool to 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 find situations in real life where we notice how things stand out right for example if you look at this gate right in front of us right you see all the flowers there mm -hmm. and all that that would be if you saw that in real life it would be something that even if it was on a wall it immediately spring to mind you're like wow these are cool flowers and all that right yeah let's take a picture yeah exactly <laughs> like we, we we do that a lot like, um and uh, it's no fun to go it's no fun to go uh exploring in the real world with exploring in the real world is how i call it because i'm <laughs> such a nerd <laughs> um uh, with other environment artists and level designs because you just stop and take pictures of the ground and you know <laughs> just like oh look at this rock Remember my oh, that's a nice grass <laughs> yeah. my buddy mark would stop when we went to san francisco for gdc he'd stop at every fucking hydrant and take a picture <laughs> and like because all of them look different it's like very very cool um anyway so these flowers they they pop out right and mm -hmm. um I, as a level designer, look at that and go like, wow, these flowers, they really, really caught my attention. Is there a way we can use that in a game, for example, right? And then I look at our gates that we're building and I'm thinking, okay, so I want the player to go through this gate. Maybe adding these very colorful flowers when there's no other colorful flowers around, and there were others around, you know, this is just an example, um, is a way of us to highlight this content, make it stand out yeah. more, make it more obvious, right? Um, and... This is sort of the kind of interesting thing between the video game and real life. Where in real life, we kind of sometimes have rules to, to design, like making these stuff, architectural rules and all that, but it's much more free form. I, as a level designer, look at the real world and then kind of see how can I make this stuff and use it to create rules in the game world that the player understands, but that don't feel like video game rules. So for example, what should be I'm not sure how consistently we managed to pull it off, but what should happen in, in Beauclair uh, is that, or in Toussaint rather, that we were trying to solve a problem of telegraphing to the player which doors lead to accessible interiors and which don't, right? And uh, we tried to do this from a distance, you know, so that you wouldn't have this where you run up to a door and be like, yeah, okay, there's not accessible, fuck. So you go to okay. the next one, right? So what we tried to do 
is that we would try to reserve the white painted doors for doors that would lead to accessible interiors versus just the wooden doors to kind of keep them, you know, like these on the right okay, shouldn't be right. accessible interior. Please, please, please. Ha! But there it's... you go. <laughs> uh, you know, to kind of so, create... So how about this on the left? Oh, God. But to kind of create this... It's wooden, but white. Ha! Oh. Create this sort of... <laughs> Fuck, yeah, what? To create this sort of... Uh, subtle rule set and it's not something that we actively point out to the player like hey know this and learn about this right but it's something that you know like subtly can be I think sort subconsciously of, maybe they will find out about it yeah and, and these white doors they they just pop a bit more right mm -hmm. when you look around yeah. you'd rather notice these and be rather tempted to go to these doors then and the the you know wooden colored ones are more subtle oftentimes mm -hmm. and kind of blend into the background although admittedly from you know to, to criticize ourselves a bit um we do have this struggle of executing stuff like this consistently due to the sheer scope of our games yeah. right the, <laughs> the amount of doors and in, in, in witcher 3 in total is insane like i i think i counted them once because someone on twitter challenged oh, me there, once. yeah there was actually like this meme going on uh, is there more wheels or doors in the world so ah, I don't so, know if it's I mean, more I mean it's about real world, but in The Witcher. <laughs> in The Witcher, I think we have more than three thousand, definitely more than two thousand five hundred doors, mm -hmm. um, interactive doors in in the game. Uh, that's a lot of doors. <laughs> that, and you know the fun thing is like there's a bit of a meme that that I think Fabian sort of kickstarted to one of our you know uh, uh, awesome awesome members of the community team. <laughs> Uh, PR rather, PR, I think. Yeah. yeah, my bad. Um, uh, and so, so I, it, it is about my connection to doors, right? When really I only place them. I don't really do much with doors, but like sort of people associate myself with doors much more closely than than you should. <laughs> However, I can't help but also notice that inadvertently. Somehow I end up talking about doors very often. <laughs> so, so there is a connection. <laughs> yeah, there, there must be some grain of truth. The reality though being that doors are probably some of the most complex, and it's, it sounds like a joke, but it really is the truth, some of the most complicated logical elements in a video game because they need to work in so many different ways and scenarios, right? Like um, in one moment, from an NPC sort of logic, right? In one moment they need to be a wall, so people, you know, when it's locked, people acknowledge that they can't just walk through it. And another, that wall doesn't exist anymore and the NPC now needs to understand that they can walk through it, right? And yeah. it's like, and this can dynamically change it when the game runs. Like something can cause the door to be locked, right? While the NPC is standing next yeah. to it and then suddenly he needs to understand that no longer this he is... Go and, there. and this causes a huge, huge, you know, like uh, <laughs> I um, problem for... AI scripting and all of that stuff, something every developer everywhere in the world in every studio sign like we're afraid of doors to the point of and um, where if I recall correctly there's some games that actually just don't feature them, right? Because I remember Assassin's <laughs> Creed like No doors? Yeah, some Assassin's Creed games definitely um the, the older ones, they just, yeah. just don't have doors because you know like doors are fucking hardcore. And I remember when we were shipping Witcher 3 or making it we fucking thought it was mega brilliant that Geralt would push the door when you'd kind of, you know, like kind of... So uh, you don't even have to uh, push any buttons. Yeah, yeah, just, just like it. Geralt just walks through and he puts his hand on it, you know, and pushes <laughs> it, which is like technological marvel at the time. But, you know, <laughs> um, developers look at it and go like, holy shit, what the fuck is How going did on? They and players to do are this? like, they don't even notice it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Thank you for coming to our tech to to talk about doors. <laughs> <laughs> I feel so. How did this happen? <laughs> okay, so we always end up with doors. Uh, so let me just two more questions. Let me ask yes. you two more questions. First question is minimap. How do you feel about it? Like you put so much effort into designing level, uh, telling pre uh, players where, where to go just through level design, and then yeah. they have everything on a map or a mini map. Like, what's the connection? <laughs> I need to be careful here because I have personally, ver personally, I have very strong feelings about it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's again, you know, drawing on this line, sort of what kind of experience we're trying mm -hmm. to create and for whom you're trying to create this kind of experience, right? And for us, it's really important as a studio that puts storytelling and you know our stories in the foreground and trying to otherwise create a smooth experience for players to experience these stories, to um, put in place the mechanisms and tools that 
let this story shine. Mm -hmm. um, and having a mini map in uh, our games is one of these, you know, approaches for us to make uh, the exploration exp uh, experience and sort of like you get the clues marked on the mini map yeah. as well and everything, you know, to give the player a really easy way of understanding when they're doing the right thing, right? And mini maps, um, as much flag as I think they like ha to have. Um, if you really think about it, they, they provide information that other systems really can't, right? So if you look at the minimap, you can, you know, get a good lay of the land around yeah, you from definitely. a perspective that you as a player don't have. You can understand the shape of the, the surroundings around you, right? Like you, you can stand in front of a building, but you know the building ends without being able to look behind it because you can look at the minimap, mm -hmm. right? And that's valuable information it, whether you are consciously realize it or not as you explore the game world. Um, however, I do personally think it's a problem that, you know, it can create this sort of um, over-reliance on the minimap, whereas players will spend more of their time, most of the time, looking at the top right corner of the screen as opposed to the beautiful world yeah, that's yeah, that created on top of them. To which I say, we always, in our games, add the possibility for anyone to disable the minimap, right? And usually, I think, I gen genuinely speaking, I think um, Witcher 3 probably is more easily played without minimap than, than Cyberpunk. It's less complicated, I guess. Yeah, because, you know, you have this ability of far sight that in Cyberpunk's city jungle of Night City, you can't really see mm. far ahead because there's a huge skyscraper in front yeah. of you, right? But here, you know, if you turn out the, off the minimap, you could still kind of find your way around simply by looking at the landmarks around you and all that. So you can see how the style of the game has an effect on whether minimap or not also, you know, uh, should be implemented. Um, so, yeah, it's a difficult, complicated topic. I personally, you know, recommend anyone to try to turn off the minimap and just see and experience how that alters your exploration yeah. experience. If you don't like it, turn it back on, right? But it's interesting to just experience, maybe even for a brief moment, how it changes the way you look at the game world and to, to see how these elements which you know you really don't spend spend a lot of time thinking about usually oh, when you play let's see sebastian is uh, hiding oh. the minimap oh it's proof we can do it <laughs> right and yeah. how that look at it now you know like for me even now as i was talking about it, i constantly kept looking at the minimap yeah that's now, actually true now i look at this corner and there's nothing there yeah it feels, it feels so, so i can empty. focus on the view yeah it's it's an interesting observation really how such a seemingly small minimap can actually um, have a huge impact on mm -hmm. you know the, the the game experience. And funnily enough, they're also not fun to make. You know, like <laughs> minimaps are also one of these things that are much more complicated to make than you think and you'd like them to be. Uh, I remember um, both in in Witcher Three and in Cyberpunk, creating our minimaps um, has been like a like a really really mm -hmm. um, complicated, probably more so complicated than it should be kind of process. Um, and there's a lot of logic that runs behind them that kind of makes it difficult, right? For Cyberpunk, for example, we took a long time to um, zoom out the minimap when you get into the car. <laughs> People kind of gave us flack yeah. for this, right? Um, but the reality also is that there were some really complicated technical reasons for why we mm -hmm. had to kind of postpone that, right? Because the way the minimap is rendered, it um, you know renders the world in so-called tiles that take the texture, just very simply speaking, right? And the further you zoom it out, the more tiles need to be loaded at the same yeah. time, which kind of, you know, just needs to go somewhere in the hardware, right? So, um, you know, f that just means that you need to kind of make these performance gains somewhere else before you can just mindlessly just zoom out, right? Um, and potentially, if you don't do it, melt existing hardware. Oh my God. These are the considerations that we need to make constantly, right? And uh, uh, it's, it's uh, stuff that when it comes to game making, as I said, you know, I don't just say that to make ourselves look better by going like, <laughs> your video game is super complicated. <laughs> look at us, how we're t tackling these complicated <laughs> topics. But it's, uh, in, in video game development, it really, perhaps sadly, I don't know if it, you know, uh, is the case that everything you see is much more complicated than it might seem. Perhaps for the better, because it would mean otherwise I wouldn't have a job yeah, probably. Yeah, everyone could then, just do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay, so thank you. We started with the minimap and went into, uh, <laughs> into the entire rant. Yeah. 
So last question, and you don't you just just have to answer one one word, Tris Orion. <laughs> Oh no! The question <laughs> uh, dividing. It's um, it's Shani. No, 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 no! Come on, this is like the diplomatic answer. Um, well, how is that diplomatic? <laughs> if I'm faced with one one evil or another, I'd rather not choose at all. <laughs> um, okay. Hmm. <laughs> we just heard, get it, I'm yeah. getting a hint. Uh, I think Tris. I think Tris, but I also will say I have a very personal connection to Tris because I was very involved in making locations for her quest line in, in Witcher 3. So, um, well, but also kind of for, for Yennefer. But like, so uh, the, the location that one of the, the Tris quests takes place in, um, oh God, what was the name in the game? Vegelbud Estate. The development name was Dawn Estate, you know, so that's how I usually still refer <laughs> Easier. to it. Um, used to start out as a relatively small kind of mansion. And throughout development, it just kind of kept growing, growing, growing. And the whole Triss thing wasn't originally meant to happen there. Um, but it was kind of just added on to it later yeah. when they saw, oh, we have this cool mansion. Like, can we have a labyrinth? And we added the maze and all that stuff, right? So um, it's one of these locations where... And the stuff that I work on has this sort of tendency for where it to happen, where I do, like, place a thing that's, like, somewhat small and just keeps growing and growing. <laughs> People latch onto it. They add ideas and all that stuff. And it just becomes... Bigger and yeah, bigger and yeah. bigger, and then we added the horse racing, and suddenly this is a huge quest hub, essentially. <laughs> so, yeah. Tris. Okay, the answer is Tris. No, <laughs> no, no, guys. I think we will finish on that. Uh, you don't have to, like, you know, write two miles hate messages on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I was forced to this. You know, I have a different answer. You heard it. <laughs> Okay, so thank you guys for joining me today. It was a really, really great talk. Uh, and thank you guys uh, for watching with us. Uh, and see you next week. Next week we are going to stream Gwent, the Witcher card game. Thank you very so, much. Yeah, thank you. See ya. <laughs>